Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Hello and welcome to a Captain's Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Frabiger, and after spending the majority of my life in the pursuit of becoming an airline captain, I realized getting to the top of the mountain in my career was not where the happiness and satisfaction were. At the age of 34, I quit my job to pursue a new life as an entrepreneur. This podcast is my way of helping people who feel stuck in life, or even for those who hit the top of the mountain, but still don't feel very happy or satisfied or fulfilled. I'm here to help you change that. It's time to become the captain of your own life. I'm not perfect. I don't pretend to be. This podcast is full of not only my life lessons, but lessons from other successful leaders, not only in business, but in everyday life. I hope you find some value, and if so, please subscribe and share this with other like-minded individuals so that that together we can make a positive impact on the world. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of a Captain's Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Freiberger, and today joining me is a fellow serial entrepreneur, um, somebody who I've, I've personally had the pleasure of sitting down with, uh, Khalil uh, Kamis. And uh, Khalil, thank you for jumping on today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today, Kyle. I'm super excited to see what side of the hole we go down. <laughs> you own five Harvey's restaurants right now, which is a fast food chain restaurant. Uh, they're pretty popular. I, are they in the States? No, just Canada no. today. Oh, so it's a Canadian. So, hey, maybe you'll be the yeah. one that pushes that over the border and uh, all our, our American friends can taste the deliciousness of the, the, Harvey's, the Harvey's burger. Um, you know, you're in a professional organization for entrepreneurs as well. So I know that you do a lot of personal and professional development that way. And, uh, and you've made a lot of changes over COVID. So we're definitely going to jump into that. Um, I'm just going to let you speak a little bit of, right off the bat and let you speak, um, give you the microphone is a better word and, and talk us through, you know, just start to finish why you got into entrepreneurship and then just how, you know, what happened, where you started, and kind of where you are now. Yeah, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's always <laughs> a little bit of an outer body experience uh, hearing somebody rhyme off part of your resume. So I um, really appreciate that. Like I said, appreciate uh, being here and excited for this conversation. So I guess. Absolutely, man. So, so you know, starting with entrepreneurship and the passion um, definitely came from my family. Um, my family are refugees to Canada 50 years ago from East Africa. A dictator called Idi Amin. And um, in Africa, my grandparents had businesses. And once they got settled in Canada and were able to, to scrape together enough money, um, they bought a little greasy spoon restaurant downtown Guelph called Diane Downtown. And I just grew up in the hospitality industry, getting paid 10 cents a dish rack uh, when I was probably too young to be working in the restaurant to push dishes through the dishwasher. And, hey, you made, more than, um, you made more than me as a kid, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, and it just carried through. So I went to the University of Guelph, kind of stayed home, close to home, uh, close to, we had a really great tight knit family and um, met some incredible people and contacts there where we uh, started a little event production business and um, we threw parties, uh, we did charity events, we did fashion shows, um, you know, our claim to fame is we did the weekend's first ever show outside of Toronto. Um, in the small town of Guelph, New York Times wrote a really funny article about how he canceled the show in New York to play a little lodge in small town of <laughs> Guelph, Ontario. Um, and then graduated university and joined my father in the family business of Harvey's. At that time, we had two locations and um, wasn't quite sure where I wanted the future to go and really just honed it on the entrepreneur skills working with him. And we slowly started to grow that. Um, so I opened a few more locations and um, like you mentioned, Kyle, we're at five today, um, about to, to do two more. Um, that should close in about four weeks, which is very exciting. Um, and it's really exciting for our team because our team gets to grow. We have some really amazing people that are ready for the next step. And um, being able to purchase a business because we have people on our team that want to run it is just a really cool feeling. Um, it's, what, it's why I do what I do uh, every day. And then, you know, during that Harvey's time, wanted to see if there was something we could do to, to grow a brand. So I met Jared and Mickey, uh, my partners and co-founders of Crafty Ramen uh, about four years ago after they opened a little shop downtown Guelph and just loved everything that they were doing. So we partnered up to initially grow a restaurant brand and we opened our second location, downtown Kitchener, 
right before COVID hit. Um, so we needed to figure out a way to bring the crafty experience home to our customers and, and obviously survive through the pandemic. So we started making a, a ramen meal kit that you could make your own ramen at home uh, in about 15 minutes. And it just took off on social media as everybody's home on their phones, scrolling, scrolling. They see this cool ramen kit and we got people asking um, from all across the country if we could ship them the product. So we built an e-commerce website and that naturally grew into, you know, independent grocery stores really wanting to support us um, and saying, hey, we'd love to sell this. There's nothing like this in grocery today. And now we have three full-fledged um, revenue channels. Um, we're just about to do a national distribution deal for our frozen ramen product to make its way into grocery across the country. So some really exciting things uh, ahead on the horizon on, on both sides of the coin. I think our listeners could uh, could use a little bit of um, a little bit more information on just this uh, this massive transition that happened right before, or or this uh, this massive. Um, you know, challenges that arose just before COVID hit, not to mention the COVID challenge itself. Um, opening up a franchise in Kitchener just before uh, COVID hit and then having to adapt. Talk us through that. Yeah. Um, opening a restaurant is never easy. <laughs> um, and when it's the number two of a mom and pop shop, it's a, it's a whole different game. There's no playbook. You don't have all the templates and everything that the the big franchises have and they've took it taken years to develop um so we had opened the restaurant and the first couple months were really busy and and they were difficult because we hadn't really done this with brand credibility before when jared and mickey Mm -hmm. opened well there was three of them and they were lined up around the corner and they had that ability to say hey we're too busy we got to close for a couple days and reset like on your second location when you have brand credibility you can't do that right right so it took us a couple months to really get settled down and just as we were turning the corner and and getting our operations really tight um the pandemic hit and i remember um watching what was happening in the market and just saying hey we don't have the big team let's just learn from what the bigger bigger restaurant chains are doing and you know follow them because brand brand trust becomes very important in in times of fear right so you want to make sure that your community can trust you and your brand and your product to to do the right thing um so we actually closed our dining rooms a couple days before it was mandatory um just again following the lead from some other leaders in the market Uh, and i remember sitting in our dining room and i think it was like two days after lockdown Jared and I are looking at the sales from the day before and we did like 10% of what the restaurant would normally do on a Wednesday. And we're just like, oh my God. Like, wow. There was a moment where we were researching bankruptcy trustees before the government came out with all their um, subsidies. Cause we're like, what did we just, we just opened this thing. We have this huge bank loan. Um, and this, oh, every time I tell the story, it reminds me of there's this graph called the emotional journey of creating anything great. So Google it. It's just incredible. It's got all these different plots of feelings as you go through the journey of building anything, whether it's a business, a family, uh, a friendship. Um, it's, it's really cool. So the start was really intense. We actually, um, jumped on a initiative called one table and got a whole bunch of uh, restaurateurs to record their story in the first few weeks that we were sharing with government to, to really let them know we need subsidies. So we're not going to say we're responsible for the government subsidies, but um, there was something just getting the community together when everybody was struggling and ha- being able to share our stories um, helped in, in the hard days of COVID. Um, and then the government subsidies came out and we started to get some clarity and, and we were able to take some of those monies and reinvest in um, you know, the meal kit that I spoke about that was born in the early days of COVID to try and keep ourselves busy, but also bring the experience home to our customers. The best thing about crafty are these big open kitchens and you get to see your food made. So the meal kit brings some of that home. So you've said a, a few different things that, um, you know, I do uh, work with a lot of leaders and, and, you know, you and I were talking about a few of these principles before we got on this, this call again and, and in our previous conversations um, so I just want to I want to bring it to, to the surface here and help our listeners again kind of understand what you're talking about when you say like, you know, the last point that you made was it's a big open kitchen. People see your food being made. Um, you're also talking a lot about brand recognition. You're talking about, you know, when you have your, your second restaurant open, brand recognition is really uh, powerful, really important. Like you can't just close your, your door for a couple of days to reset. Um, but why are those why are those things so important? 
there's just so many options. Um, there are so many options. There's so many ways to give feedback. So if you're not on point and you're starting to get what we call brand reputation degraded through Google reviews or Facebook comments or Facebook reviews, it's really hard to recover from that. Like so many purchase decisions are made on a quick Google or a quick check into somebody's social media page. Um, and if you have the wrong commentary or the, or the wrong reviews there, it's, it's really hard to recover from that in today's world. And I think the second point is attention spans are really short um, with the world of technology and, and social media. So <laughs> to, to, a, to capture that audience is one thing to keep them uh, as a whole another thing. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, in, in the modern day leadership, a big challenge is the fact that we have technology, globalization and, and more transparency. And, yeah. and to, to further describe those, it's, you know, you can somebody can be a, a cameraman. Like when I was flying uh, airplanes and and uh, working as a captain, we had 200 reporters in the back. That's something that we always talked about is like there's 200 reporters in the back. You know, we, we have to be so much more vigilant on what we do and say and like you said it's very easy to it, it's hard to build up that trust but it's very easy to lose it if you don't mind speak about why why that's healthy as well as it is it's it obviously it's challenging and you you have to be on top of it but what is what's the benefit what's the why is it a healthy thing to have this this um this review system build these relationships with your, your clients and so on, uh, so forth. Yeah. I think when you were talking there, my mind went to two of our core values and uh, one is integrity and one is radical openness. So integrity inside and outside radical openness, um, both internal and external more so internal. Uh, but what that allows us to do is just do the right thing. And if you do the right thing and you talk to your customers as humans, as people who understand, um, those, those review systems lead to, my, my opinion, a more positive world. Because if you're open and honest, both internally and externally, um, and you lead with integrity, then there's no way to argue it. It's just, hey, this is what happened, and this is our story. And you're not trying to cut through any BS of, of corporate jargon to try and hide something negative that may have happened or, um, or, turning, or an internally turning down a teammate. And, having that old mentality of, of running a business, right? So the, you know, the radical openness has really allowed people to say, hey, wait, I don't agree with that. And this is why we're not judging them for that. It's, it's we want to hear uh, feedback from both our customers and our team alike. Wow, you said a, a pretty important word there, judging. Uh, how does that fit into you as a leader, your organization, uh, your customers, you, you kind of talked a little bit about your customers already, but how does, how does, um, how, how do you balance that? Yeah. Like on the customer feedback side, you know, a lot of people who are in it every day, um, when a bad review or, a, or something bad comes through, we, we take it to heart. Um, but if we just take it at face value and say, Hey, we're not always right. And, you know, sometimes we mess up and how can we learn and take that information and get better and change our attitude around that feedback, not only does it help us live our day to day, it help us, helps us become better and, and change our mindset to a bit more positive than negative. And I think one of the important things is that, you know, most things we're going to talk about today are easier said than done. Um, we're all human and, you know, in practice, it's not always possible um, to have the emotional restraint that we can have on a podcast. I think it's a, a good way of putting it is just shortening that time between that emotional response becoming aware of that emotional response and then understanding what you were saying is that every single ounce of feedback, I promise you, whether it's good, bad, it doesn't matter. Um, you can change it into a positive. The good, bad is the judgment part. But if you take the judgment away from whether it's a good or bad feedback, what you do, um, I don't know if this is what you do specifically, um, and maybe you have your own version of this, but um, a big piece of my personal life or in my business is, is this useful? Is this not useful? And it's like this filtration system that immediately it's not an emotional thing. You're asking yourself, is this going to help me or is this not going to help me? And now even the worst review, you could look at that and be like, is this going to help me or is this not going to help me? Maybe there is something that is true about that review. Maybe there is. And then if you say so, then now there's something constructive. Again, it's all about adapting, evolving. Uh, and, and this isn't anything personal. This isn't anything about you as a human being. This is about a, a, a brand, a, a restaurant, a, you know, 
so much more a different um a different identity than rather than you know yourself when you take these these critical feedback to uh, these pieces of feedback to heart so i find that um you know, just ask yourself, is it useful? Is it not useful? It's, it's, it's about filtering that feedback. What do you do specifically? Do you have any, any, any that's, sort of, uh... um, that's really interesting. I really like that filter. It's a really, it's a really great way to help remove that emotion from it. Right. Cause we process the emotion as humans before we do, um, the ration. And then, which is why you kind of mentioned shortening that time frame uh, between the emotional reaction and the rational reaction. I don't really have a system today. One thing I just always go back to is like a little bit of a mantra. It's like nothing is good or bad. Our mind makes it so, Mm -hmm. um, which is basically how you, you opened up, um, you opened up there. So yeah, I don't have a tool today and I'm probably going to put that one into, into use. I'm curious, what, what is your definition of success in whether it's in business life? Doesn't matter. But what is your uh, definition of success? Yeah, so it's it's definitely changed over time. When uh, I first started in the business world, it was the shiny car, the fancy house, um, anything tangible that like looked cool from the outside. Um, you know, now one of the things that I read every day is what other people think of you is none of your business, um, and that is definitely one of the very, much easier said than done. Um, so the attitudes really changed around passion and purpose. And, and for me, that's watching people grow in the organization. So like I said earlier, you know, being able to buy another business because we have people that are like, I want to run my own store. I can do this. Give me that opportunity. Um, for me, that's what keeps me going every day. Uh, um, I think it's really cool to be able to work yourself out of a job uh, and see somebody else um, be able to do that. Because at the end of the day, if you're in business uh, and you're not able to walk away from it, you purchase yourself a, a job. Um, a, re- a real business and a real company, in my opinion, is one that you can walk away from uh, and it just keeps running. And to do that, um, you have to remove the ego. Because um, if you have the ego, then you will never be able to walk away from your business and, and watch it run. And to me, that that's success. And when you were talking about that definition, you said something uh, key. You said uh, building people up. like the satisfaction and the fulfillment and building other people up. Why is that your new definition of success? How does that transition from building yourself up per se or working or, or focusing on what you can do to focusing on what other people can do? How, do, how does that transition help you? I think it goes back to the shared human experience and we're all in this together. And when I realized that um, we can go further, faster, farther, uh, together than we can on our own. And when I can, when I see, I truly believe with the right team, anything is possible. Whether you're Elon Musk putting a rocket on the moon or Crafty Ramen trying to become the household name for ramen across North America, um, with the right people and the right attitude, you can do anything. And that's why I think it's so important. In that note, what's your definition of leadership then? Um, also changed over time. Um, there was a time where the leader was supposed to know everything, um, follow their rules or else. And it was a more of a dis- disciplinary style of, of leader. And now it's, it's, um, really leading with vulnerability. One of the things um, we do in our strategic planning at Crafty Ramen is everybody on the leadership team has to put up a couple failures from last year, uh, and how we learn from it. So we really try to create that culture of it's okay to make a mistake, but it's unacceptable not to learn from it um, because as a small, we'll call it a startup, trying to do really big things. If we have that ego, we're not getting anywhere. But if we have the humility of saying, listen, we don't know everything. And we're willing to try and fail and learn or go find the right people that can help teach us this. Um, we're just naturally going to go further. And we actually think it even bleeds into um, retention. People want to be part of a team like that. Um, where they can surround themselves around the purpose and then they feel purpose-driven to come to work every day. Have you ever read the book, The Culture Code? I have not. Well, it's, uh, you're describing The Culture Code. I'm, I'm actually just reading it now, but um, definitely started diving into what creates the culture of success or or, or this culture that you're, you're speaking to because um, how does vulnerability, right? Like how, do, how, do, how does being vulnerable or admitting your mistakes or talking about your mistakes help anybody? And I don't normally give advice on this podcast, but maybe I'm going to give some advice right now. And it's not so much about, <clears throat> you know, be vulnerable uh, as that will help if you're, you know, be vulnerable, but, uh, but it's shifting your focus. If you're listening to what 
um, Khalil is saying, like shift your focus from thinking <clears throat> it's it shift your focus from trying to avoid mistakes or, or trying to avoid challenges or trying to avoid difficult situations. Just it's one step further and shift your focus to what am I learning? Because yeah. the people that avoid the challenges, avoid the mistakes, they think, oh, well, my life's so much easier. I don't have to go through all that shit. Like, why are you putting yourself in that hard position or that awkward position when I have my, you know, $80,000 a year job that brings me security in my paycheck? And I'm like, you know, and, and anytime somebody says that to me, it's like, does that bring you security? Is that like what happened over COVID? Did anybody get laid off? Could you get laid off? Then what happens? What are you going to do if you get laid off? And it's funny because people have to think about it, but a lot of times I get the answer that, well, I'd have, you know, I'd find another job. I'm like, okay, so your security doesn't come from that specific job that you have. Your security comes in your ability to keep going, aka your ability to learn from the challenges. You know, we got to stop avoiding the security and the safety that we think we're in, this bubble that we think we're in, because our brains are wired for survival. They're not wired to to push yourself through a challenge and adapt and learn as much as they are to retreat and, you know, seek shelter and hide from the lions. But we're still operating like we need to uh, seek shelter and retreat from the lions, because if we lose our job, we might die. Um, so I know I, I went off on a tangent there. So well, back, I think they, back I think to they you. say life, life. I think they say life starts where it gets uncomfortable, um, and you know, obviously not for everyone. Um, but we try to do like launch and learn. So if you have a new marketing initiative, we have something we want to try, loyalty program, whatever it is. Okay, let's get it eighty percent there and get it out there, and let's just learn and, and iterate because you can spend a year in a boardroom trying to get something perfect. But once once you actually launch it, that's when the true learning and iteration starts. So the sooner you can do that, um, obviously you have to protect the brand and the trust and all those things I said earlier. Uh, but once you're comfortable, those things are covered up. Get it out there and start learning from it. I think it was a Steve Jobs book where you know they 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 released the iPhone before like it wasn't even close to being done and tested. Right. And then they just collect. They were really good at collecting feedback. And the moment they got the feedback that taught them what they needed to change, like there's no such thing as a perfect anything. So if there's no such thing as a perfect anything, then what's the right time to release a product? Well, there's there's no such thing. So it's, exactly. it's kind of funny. But that feedback system, like you said, again, is this useful? Is this not useful? Those reviews and getting back to that initial um, question I was asking you about how important that that. Um, you know, not being judgmental of those reviews or of that feedback. I think this is aligns perfectly with that. Um, how do you, how do you build that family culture? Like, how do you, you know, you talked a little bit about um, everybody puts up some of their mistakes on the board sort of thing. What else do you do in your business to build that, that connection culture? And why is that important? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough in a hybrid world. Um, significantly harder they you know the restaurant teams they're together every day so building that that culture and that vibe is, is significantly easier we um, we do a daily stand-up um, every morning with our leadership team that is basically all remote um, Jared and Mickey you know they're on the floor in and out the, the those of us that are in what we call our office team at crafty um, we're on a daily stand-up every day and we do a one word open and a one word close on a, a how you're feeling so we all kind of get a pulse of each other's feelings uh, first thing in the morning as we start the day. And I think that's important because if somebody starts the day and they say overwhelmed, the way you talk to that person for the rest of the day might change, right? You might be like, hey, Kyle, I need this ASAP. That on a normal day, if I said, hey, I'm happy today. Uh, but if you say overwhelmed, I might then change the way we respond to you throughout the day. Hey, I know you said you're overwhelmed. Um, let me know if this is possible today. If not, no worries. Um, or me as a leader, I might say that, hey, let's take five minutes, hop on a screen share and review your task list. Let's reprioritize. Did we put, is the overwhelming coming from outside of the business or inside? If it's inside, then I can help do my job as leader and, and re-resource uh, and making sure we're, we're taking care of our people. So I think, you know, things like that that we can do on a daily basis to show a bit more care um, and a bit more openness on how we're feeling um, really helps to bring the family together. Do you find that some of these skills that you've been developing as for leadership um, 
you know, you've been putting in time with the entrepreneur organization in Ontario. Um, do you find like a lot of these skills overflow into your general day to day life, your personal life? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, speaking from experience instead of advice at a dinner party um, is great. You know, and when you're having some glass of wine with friends, no, nobody really enjoys the preacher. Um, but if you're if you're just sharing your experience, um, it, it becomes a, a much more enjoyable conversation. So I think the the root of it is just how do you be a good human? And that's translatable in business and in you know personal and family lives. Yeah, I think it's so true. And going back to some of these concepts for people that are listening, because we're going to have, you know, whether it's uh, young, old uh, mothers to entrepreneurs to workers to it doesn't matter. The one thing that you said that I, I wanted to bring back up is, is you know, growth starts uh, when you start to challenge yourself. Um, I forget how you phrased it, but life begins when you where it when gets the uncomfortable, challenge, where it gets uncomfortable. Right. I, sounds like a David Goggins thing. Is that David Goggins <laughs> things? Or who's, I'm, I'm reading his new I've book right now. And from I'm everywhere just, and I, I apologize I to anybody that I've quoted <laughs> and not given uh, reference to. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, same, same. But that's 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 the whole point is like there's knowledge everywhere. There's quotes everywhere. There's there's there. You can go to a library. You can go to Google. You can get it on a hike. It, it's everywhere now. And, and it's the same shit from years and years and years. It's evolved based yeah. and adapted to like our times. Like I was talking about before, technology, globalization, um, transparency. So it's adapted. And that's what we're trying to do here is share our experiences based upon the adaption of those specific pieces of knowledge and skills and we're talking about the actions that we've taken or, or in the specific yeah. your, your entrepreneur um, life the mistakes the actions and that creates the wisdom that creates the wisdom that we're sharing with people it doesn't suggest that we're telling anybody how to do it we're suggesting that here's our our experiences take what you will f- ask yourself is this useful to me is this not useful and the, the reason I was going through that long-winded um, uh, explanation is because when you get to that challenge, every single person, I don't care who you are, challenge is where growth happens. It's a fact. It makes perfect rational sense. Unless you're making mistakes, how there's no learning. You have to be learning. So it doesn't mean that your challenges have to be as big as my challenges or Khalil's challenge. It's not about comparing challenges. It's like, what would be a challenge in your life? If you are just finally working out and you're severely overweight and you know you can barely get up a flight of stairs, then that's your challenge. If you're uh, yeah. young and in shape and maybe mentally you're trying to put yourself in ice baths because that's your challenge, <laughs> speaking from experience. But, but it's yeah. like find new ways to challenge yourself. It doesn't have to consume your life and it doesn't have to be all the time. But I know for a fact that even just ice baths for me, it's, it's been two years now. And I keep making it colder and I keep trying to do different things to make it more uncomfortable. And it's just, it's just practicing that concept of, okay, challenge, reward, challenge, lesson, challenge, growth, and, and just cultivating that mindset. So I think that's just super important to point out and, um, taking up some of the airtime for you, but I think, I think, I think it's just the overarching theme of today's call. So, um, any, any, any other um let, let, let me ask you this what is a book that you've read and this might take you a few minutes to think about but it you know maybe if it's just in the last year but what's a book that you've read that you know you would recommend to anybody and why oh um recently i just finished shoe dog by phil knight which is oh, cool yeah. for me internally because um, a lot of those stories are pains that we're feeling in, in the startup business today and um, very aspirational. Um, I think, you know, one that I always t- tell people to read, yeah. and I, I will tell you if you haven't read this, is How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, so yeah. if you want to go back to like being a good human, and, and I think the title of that book is is very misleading. Um, it's written just, af- just after post, post-World post War II era, and it's still ex- extremely relevant going back to these, this stuff has been here forever. Like I, I read the Daily Stoic every day. Stoic is thousands of years old. A lot of the same principles um, that we're discussing today but yeah how to win friends and influence people is just a great quick easy read on just how to be a good human and um very fitting i think for the conversation we're having today 
what specifically, um, you know, you say how to be a good human, but what specifically about that book stands out to you? Um, some interesting points on just remembering people's names. Like we're all, we're all like, oh, I'm terrible for that. I'm terrible for that too. Um, so some tips and tricks in there, but really understanding why it's important. Um, I think that's a, that's a good thing um, in leadership as well, right? Just giving the why behind um, things that we're doing. And um, I think they say something like when somebody else hears, when somebody hears their own name, it's the sweetest sound in the world. So you're like, oh, okay. Now I want it. Like now I want to remember your name so I can give you that experience at the end of this conversation when I've only met you for a couple seconds. I'm like, oh, thank you, Kyle. You're like, oh, good, cool. They remembered that uh, my name. And um, you know, in, in this world, um, nobody's going to remember what our car looked like or what we achieved or what we built. But everybody will always remember how we made them feel. You know, that's, uh, it's actually a very similar, I, I, if the first thing that came to mind was, was basically the, the same thing, a little different perspective on it, but, but very similar. And, you know, it, it's funny because I think a lot of people think that they have to have some tangible value in order to be valuable. But if you just focus on saying somebody's name a few times in a conversation, you are adding so much value to that person and that's leadership. And that's why everybody here can be a leader because everybody here can do that. And the more that you do that, the more that you're going to add value to that person, that more that person's going to value to you. And it's like you said, that it's a, such a simple thing that people almost don't believe it, but think about how good you feel when you hear your name. It's that so sense true. of recognition, like humans want to feel belonged right? We want to feel recognized. We want to feel like we're part of something that we're not by ourselves. Like, and hearing your name is a very triggering word to tell you that, okay, it's okay. You're safe. You're not running from the line anymore. You're not worried about your security and your survival. Like this person cares about you. And if you just focus on that, you're, you're, you'll find positive changes in your life for anybody that's listening. So I, I love that book. And my book, um, I don't know if I've said it on any episodes yet, but it's Ego is the Enemy. I tell everybody to read that. <laughs> and I know Ryan we're talking Holiday. a little bit. Oh, yeah. I, I, and it was mostly because it was the first, it was the book that came to me at the right time in my life. And this is a big piece of it too. Like a lot of these book recommendations, yeah. you can read, I've read Ego is the Enemy at least 10 times. And it resonates with me d different each time because of my experiences. But um, Ego is the Enemy is another book to help you become yeah. a better human being. That's an interesting point. Um, like the book at the right time in my life that brought up uh, emotional intelligence 2.0 for me. I, you know, when I started this journey of like trying to change attitude and when I really realized in life attitude was a choice, I think that's when life really started. Um, and that book, I remember there was one part that was like, don't get fooled by a good mood. Don't get yourself so excited about something that when it doesn't happen how you played it out in your head, that you beat yourself up for it. I was like, whoa, I do that. Yeah. And that was like one of those, like that page slapped me in the face and was like, okay, now we're starting to learn, you know, what emotional intelligence is. And, and like I said, it's just a constant work in, in progress. Like none of us are ever done this journey. I, no. Uh, I think I'm no. at like 6,000 minutes meditating on Headspace and I, I'll never stop. Yeah, same. Yeah, that's exactly it. This, and it's, so it's, it's, it's a matter of finding that happiness, fulfillment, that, that satisfaction, that, you know, all these things that people are looking for in some like end game or outcome, it doesn't exist. And it's just because it's exactly because of what you said is, is it's the process will never end. It's not, you don't want it to end because if it ever ends, it means you stop growing. And if you ever stop growing, it's boring and it's sad because now you're not, you're not getting, life's not getting any better. So it's like fall in love with that process, climb the mountain and sure you've got this goal you've got this motivating goal to reach the top of the mountain but that's not the success the success is taking a couple steps turning around looking over your shoulder seeing that the view is a little bit better and then you know understand that you've made progress understanding that things are a little bit better you know find the little yeah. things in life and well yeah everything in life is impermanent right so if, if you're not enjoying the journey you'll never enjoy where you're going yeah absolutely um, amazing, man. I, uh, <laughs> I know we could keep going and I'm sure it'd be, uh, lots to talk about, to get you back on another episode, but, um, any, any final words, uh, kind of around the, the topics that we're talking about right now? 
Um, I just feeling of gratitude. Um, super grateful to be able to have these conversations and share experiences and learn from each other. Um, we're all the student and the teacher and um, just love having conversations with like-minded individuals. So thank you. That's it, man. And, and, and a huge thank you. Thank you for coming on here. My and uh, where can people reach you? Where, where can people find you? I think you got some yeah, social media. Add, add me on LinkedIn. Um, love connecting with different people and, and having these any type of conversations. Um, I've learned so much from other business leaders and community members um, over a virtual coffee or an in-person coffee. So I'm always happy to connect. Awesome. LinkedIn and Crafty Ramen has uh, uh, an Instagram and stuff as well. And we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get all the social media links and link them in the show notes. So Awesome. Well, Khalil, thanks uh, again. And, and it's a pleasure you, chatting with you. And thank you for listening to another episode of uh, my uh, Captain's Mindset Podcast. Thanks. Thanks for watching another episode. If you found value at all in this episode, please do me two very important things. Please, number one, give us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcast. And number two, please share this on your social media or with somebody that you think would find value in it. These two things are super important for the growth of this podcast and helping us maximize our reach and the impact that we have on the world. Together, we can make a difference. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.